Praise the Lord. The seats are the front end, boys, if you want to sit down. It's going to be a long night. <laughs> Um, I've been preaching for um, just since after I got saved 39 years ago and uh, I think probably this message has intimidated me more than so many messages I've prepared before I, I just as I start to read it I start to see what what we're looking at tonight I don't think I have enough experience to, to fully understand it or fully to preach it tonight one of the words of that song that um, the brother just sang is that I'll never know what it cost to see my sin upon that cross. And that is so, so true. And we're looking at the Garden of Gethsemane tonight. And it's the start of what they call the Lord's Passion. Um, of, is the start of what he did to pay for our sins. Starts in the Garden of Gethsemane where he shed blood. And we were on his mind. Um, so we're going to read from Matthew's Gospel, it's in all the Gospels, we're going to look in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. Verse 36, Matthew 26, 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he told the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking along Peter and two of the sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is swallowed up in sorrow to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Going a little farther, he fell face down and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. He asked Peter, so couldn't you stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again a second time he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came again and found them sleeping because they could not keep their eyes open. After leaving them, he went away again and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the time is near. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let's go. See, my betrayer is near. Let's just pray and ask the Lord to speak to us tonight. Thank you, Lord. Father, I just want to thank you, Lord God, for the privilege of being here in this pulpit tonight, my God, and being able to read your word, my God. I pray, Father, you take your precious word, my God. Lord God, that you would anoint it to speak to our hearts and our lives, my God, I pray. Father. You know all things tonight, my God, I pray. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. The, um, this is straight after the, what we call the Last Supper. And um, it's where we base our breaking our bread service on a Sunday. Now it's based on what happened or after the Last Supper. It says after the Supper he took the cup. So it was the other, the Last Supper or what is the Passover meal was together. And the Passover was to remember that they came out of death into, into, into death in Egypt and into the promised land. And that, that the angel of death passed over them when they were in Egypt. Death passed over. And so at that service that night, that the Bible says that Judas had already agreed to, depray, to, to betray G Jesus. And as they broke bread together, as they had their fellowship meal together, Judas didn't take part. He left. And the Bible says he was filled with the devil. So in two places in the Bible where Satan enters into a person, is here, and the Antichrist in the future tribulation. And so he was fully entered into by the devil himself. 
and he'd gone out to betray Jesus. Jesus then after the Passover, they'd gone down to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now to give you an idea of the logistics, the geography of it, if you could imagine that at the roundabout at the top of the bank here is where the Last Supper is. And here is where the Garden of Gethsemane. That's about the distance, only it's around the corner. It's about the same distance. You can see, maybe a little bit further, you can see, maybe from the garage to that roundabout is the distance from the, from the, the place of the Last Supper, the upper room, and to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now that means that when the high priest's house is in the similar area to the upper room, a little bit behind it, that means when they came, when Judas came to, with the Romans to arrest Jesus, he could see them for a good 300 yards. He could see them. In, the Kidron Valley is a small valley. There's Jerusalem city. There's a small valley here and the Garden of Gethsemane is right at the bottom. And they come from this area here at the wall. Come from around the wall. So from this point of the wall all the way down, at least three or 400 yards, Jesus could see them coming in the middle of the night with lights and torches. Now, Gethsemane is a place where they regularly had prayed. It was a place of prayer for Jesus and his disciples. It was like their, their spot to pray. Now, obviously, the great meaning, the great thing about Gethsemane is the word Gethsemane. Amen. It comes from two Hebrew words, Gat Shemine. It means place of the olive press. Place of the olive press. Today, if you go there, it's an olive grove. Um, there's a church built there, Church of All Nations. But behind that, there's a small cave area. And that's the reckon that was the place where the olive press would be where Jesus and his disciples would have gathered to pray. So from that spot, you can, you, you, it's like looking to the garage over there with no trees. You can be able to see the walls of Jerusalem. Now three times the Bible says that he prayed. He prayed and he asked them to pray with him. He prayed and he asked them to pray. And then he, he didn't ask them no. He said, you're asleep now. And he prayed again. Three times he prayed. Now, when in olive press, in Gatsamini, how you use olives is you, you've got some wire baskets, that are uh, coir baskets, like a basket, soft weave. They look like a big hat. And you fill them with olives. Olives is a great fruit that's um, used in that country for almost everything. They use every part of it. And what our olive press works is, it's a big long bar with big stones on it. And there's three lots of stones. Big heavy ones, heavy ones and lighter ones. Three presses. But what they would do first of all, they would get these baskets of olives and they would stack them up above a big bowl. And they wouldn't press them. They would naturally release the finest of oils. It's called extra fine oil. And that isn't used for nothing else. That was only used because it was a small amount. It was the purest of oil because there was no pressing. There was no part of the fruit in it, no part of the nut in it. It was just absolutely the, the, the best of the best extra fine oil that would only be used for anointing in the, in the temple. It was in such a small amount. They would use that when they would, when they would burn an offering in the temple or they would use it for a fragrant offering before the Lord. They would mix it with perfumes and it was used for anointing the priests or anointing an animal that was only used for religious purposes, for the purpose of worship. And then the second press was a press of the heavy stone. So this bar, they'd put these, and it was, it was just rest on. And this heavy stone, it's a stone about that big, so it's quite heavy. It's about that big, I've seen them. And they rested on it, and, and the pressure starts to relieve the second oil. Now the second oil is, um, is used for food. It's, uh, it's, uh, we'll, we'll get olive oil from that we use for food and uh, the berry would be used and it would be used for soap, for cleansing, the, the, all things like that. Handy things around the home, things to help you live basically. And the final press is where the heavier stones would be the, the worst kind of oil really but it's still very, very handy because it would be crushed with the stones and everything. And, and it, would be, it was almost obliterated completely. It would almost ground down. And that's the oil, the thick oil, the heavy oil that was left. And that would be used for the small lamps. You've seen these, like, they look like a little magic lamp, little terracotta lamps with a wick in them. And that's used for lighting. It's a, it's a fuel. So none of it was wasted. There was three presses. 
And Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane was pressed three times. He prayed three times. I want to ask us a question with that in mind. Because life, I don't know about you, but life seems to press in sometimes. I don't know about you. Sometimes we're under pressure in life. Sometimes it feels like it's just normal pressure. Sometimes it's heavy pressure. Sometimes it's very, very heavy pressure that's in our lives. It can be our own fault. It can be somebody else's fault. It can be life's fault. But we go through times when we feel like we're pressed, we're, we're laden, we're, we're being pushed down upon. With that in mind, what comes out of us when we're pressed? What comes out of us when, when the pressure's on? Because what came out of Jesus Christ was worship, was given life, and was given light. That's exactly what he did. He worshipped, he prayed, he gave them life, and then he gave them light. The three things that the oil is used for under pressure. So me and you, how do we, when the pressure comes on to me and you, is, is this some, what comes out of our mouth? Is it praise? When we have pressure in life, is it worship to God? Is that, is that the oil that comes out? Is that from London? Is that for worship of God? Is that what comes out of our lives? Or when the pressure's a bit more, is it life-giving? Is it, is, it, is it something that we can give to somebody? Do we give words that people can live by? Do we give words that people can be, can be fed on? Or when the pressure's really on, are we a light to the world? Because that's what we're called to be. Me and you is called to be a light to the world. That's what we're called to be. No matter how much pressure is on, no matter how much you know, the world is coming in, we've got so soft nowadays that the world comes in and our Christianity goes out. The pressure's on, so what do we do? Instead of just living for God, instead of just allowing God to do something in our lives, pressure up, we run away from the press. We try and get away without going through pressure. Let me tell you something. Unless the pressure comes, we're not going to be used. The pressure comes, then you're used. Then we're useful. All the time we try and run away from pressure, run away from problems, run away from conviction, run away from what God wants to really do in our lives. We'll never, ever, ever be used. God wants us in that place of the press. It's not the devil, it's God. He wants to prepare you. He wants to get rid of the dirt. He wants to put pressure on our lives to see what comes out that we could be useful to God. <coughs> see this garden, it's, it's, as I've been studying the last couple of days, it's amazed me. Because in this garden, and I've been there many times, it's really the start of where Jesus starts, the payment of sin. It's the start of the call, the passion of Jesus Christ. Right, leading up to death on the cross. And the resurrection. In the Garden of Eden, many, many years before the beginning of time, there was a tree. And the Bible calls Adam, he's called the first Adam. Adam means man. The second Adam is a picture and a type of Jesus Christ. When you read in the Bible, the second Adam is referring to Jesus Christ. When you look at the, book, the book of Romans, it talks about the second Adam, which is Jesus Christ. The scripture that has talked to me, Dad, when, when he accepted the Lord. I'll never forget it. It meant something to him that day. He understood it. But at the first Adam, at a tree, all of mankind was lost to sin. All of mankind. Adam and Eve. Me and you. Me and you were in Adam and Eve. Me and you were in that line. We were the, they were our representatives before God. And we were in Adam and Eve at that time. And let me just tell you, don't blame Adam and Eve. It was me and you that sinned and took the fruit and disobeyed God. And at that tree, all mankind was lost. But as Jesus starts the passion, there's going to be another tree where all mankind is one. The second Adam goes to a tree and is crucified. And he pays the price for our sin. And all mankind can be saved. Hallelujah for that second tree in that second garden. And this is the bit really I can't understand. I, I can, I can, I'm, 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 in the last two days I've felt something of the emotion of God. I, I'm not an emotional man really. I'm not a man that really gets you know, teary eyed and things like that. But I don't think we can fully understand the agony and the pain yes. of what Jesus was going through in this garden. Amen. To the point that he sweats 
was drops of blood, it was like sweat. It, it actually literally means clots of blood was coming out of his forehead, he was under so much pressure. Now it was not the crucifixion that Jesus was worried about. Jesus had already said in every gospel, months beforehand, I'm going to Jerusalem, evil men are going to kill me. He even explain what kind of uh, death he would have. It wasn't the death on the cross that Jesus was, was in agony for. That wasn't the, that's not the agony. You know, people talk about the crucifixion like it's some of the worst thing in the world. There's other people that have worse deaths and crucifixions. Millions of people were crucified at that time. It was a terrible death, don't get me wrong. But the real the agony and pain here was when Jesus said the word, and in Mark Gospel he uses the word Abba. Abba is the, if you go in across Israel today, they all use the word Abba for dad. But it's more than just dad, it means daddy. It means my father. It means my loving father. And when Jesus cried in that garden, he said, Abba. You see, this is the point where Jesus knew there was going to be a separation in the Godhead, that he was going to be separated from the Father. And that's the real agony. And if me and you could get hold of that agony, if me and you could understand that if we're not in Christ, we're going to be separated from God forever and ever and ever. We would be in agony today. We would be fighting against sin. We would you know, we'd stay through the temptation. We would allow the world to fall on us and we wouldn't run away from Christ. If we could get some of that anguish, I think it would do us some good to realise that sin separates us from a loving God. And at this time, the Bible says that Jesus became sin. Did he sin? Absolutely not. But he took my, me and your sin upon himself. Amen. So that in, in God's eyes he became sin. And the Bible says that God cannot enter the presence of sin. God would turn his back on his own son. There would be a separation in the Godhead. That the father would be separated from the son. There would be darkness in the world. No one can fully understand it. I've talked to many groups to many people from around the world. Nobody can fully understand this mystery of what's going to happen in the Trinity at this moment. There's a little picture that's in the Old Testament. I've used it many times. Most of you will know it if you're from this church. And it's about the wheat offering in the Old Testament. And it's a picture of the cross. And the first offering's in a frying pan. So everybody can see, like a griddle, everybody can see what's in the offering pan. And the second offering's in the pot. So only those who's close to the pot can see what's in the pot. And the third offering's in the oven where nobody else can see. And it's a picture of the cross. There was people far off from the cross and they could see bits of what's happening. See some of the pain, some of the anguish. Then there were people near the cross, like Mary and the family, and they could feel almost the anguish. But with the anguish in the cross of Jesus Christ, in the heart of God, that we'll never know that happened in that oven one day. That agony. He said he was in such an, ag such an agony that it was close to death. He said, this agony is unto death. I don't know about you, but I've had a broken heart. It's a terrible feeling. You just want to be sick inside. You just The pain there, you don't know what to do with the pain. And this is multiplied a thousand times, I don't know. But the agony that happened in that garden that day, that he sweated drops of blood, that he would be doing the job that he had already been purposed for all his life. To pay the price of sin. But not only to pay the price for sin, to be the sacrifice for sin. See, Jesus was the sacrifice when, when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What was a lamb do? A lamb was taken into the temple. His throat was cut and his blood was shed for the sins of people. And Jesus, the Lamb of God, was crucified in a tree. And he was put out a spear in his side. And so they knew that he was dead and he died for me and your sin. Amen. He became sin. He became that sin offering. He took the separation from God that we deserve. Me and you, if you're not in Christ tonight. I feel so heartily sorry for you tonight. But if you're a Christian tonight, Christ has paid the price for your sin. Hallelujah. The separation that we should have from God forever in hell, Jesus Christ took upon himself and he paid the price that we do not have to die in sin. He prays this prayer and he, he actually changes the prayer halfway through. He says, Let it pass, Lord, but not my will be done, 
your will be done. What he was Jesus was saying, is there another way? If there's any other way where there's no separation, if there's any other way where Jesus is not to be separated from the Father, then not my will be done, your will be done. But the second and third prayer was, okay, Lord, it's your will. I understand that. That's it. There's no other way. And Jesus, as a man, chose to go to the cross. Twice he prayed it. When he talked to the disciples, and he said, stay with me and pray a while. Stay with me. You know, he, can, he said the, the words, well, can you not pray with me just one hour? The reason that he said that, at the Passover meal, what would happen at the Passover? They would have the, there would be four cups in the Passover. And they would talk about being in Egypt and then being in the, in the desert and then coming into the promised land and one day the Messiah coming for them. That was the four cups. And as they did that, they would talk for hours until dark about it. That's what, that was what happened. What would happen at the Passover meal afterwards. All the family would gather round. And they would talk about the things of God until night, until almost everybody fell asleep. That's something they practice even today. That they talk to the children and they talk to the family. And Jesus had just had that Passover meal. And now he's walked down to the garden of Gethsemane. He's saying, we should be talking now. Stay with me, pray with me. Can't not pray with me, just one hour. I don't know about you. I'm sick of saying I'm tired. I'm sick of saying I'm tired. And it's the weather, it's the age, all the time. I've got, I got that sick of saying, I'm not going to say it no more. I'm not going to say I'm tired, because I'm tired anyway. I'll tell you now, I'm always tired, right? But have you noticed today how life makes you tired? It robs you of your strength. There's so much things going on in the world. There's so much pleasures to offer. There's so many other things to offer that we seem to just be able to cram church in. Even though we're tired, we'll jump in the shower or we'll get changed quickly. We'll ram our tea into us to get there. When it Really, it should be the most important time. It should be the thing that we've been setting up all day to get to that point. Amen. But what do we do? We live for the world and we do so much up for the world. And then we're so tired. Yeah. Jesus, can you not just tarry with me one more hour? I think there's something for me and you in our lives that we should not allow the world to put us to sleep. That's right. That we should stay with Jesus Christ. You know, let me just tell you something. It's not many of us, definitely not me, make ourselves tired doing the will of God. It's doing our will, I get tired. Doing, doing my will, living for myself, that's what makes me tired. We need to be men and women that say, you know what? What's the most important thing in my life? What's my goals and aims today? Who am I living for today? What's my plan of attack today? What, what am I basing my life on today? Is it because we have church tonight or church on Sunday morning or a prayer meeting on Tuesday? Or is we're so busy then we're so tired for the things of God? Be careful. Jesus says, can you not just stay with me one more hour? When Jesus said, not my will be done, your will be done. That is called perfect faith. Perfect faith. Jesus absolutely trusted the Father. No matter what the outcome would be. Now Jesus knew now at this point of this prayer. That he knew what was going to happen fully. He knew there was no other way. He would already said he was going to be taken. He was going to be handed into the hands of sinners. But at this point, this is the point of no return. In fact, at the end of this, uh, at verse 46, he says, Come for the... Uh, my betrayer has already come. It means it's. It mean that word means it's already in motion. It's already started. This this roller coaster ride that Jesus is going to go from this this time of the passion has started. But Jesus absolutely trusted and had faith in whatever the Father would do. That's really what we're supposed to do as Christians, you know. When we talk about having faith in Jesus Christ, what does that mean to you and me? I'll tell you what it really means to a lot of us. It means that I believe in Jesus Christ. I have a faith in Jesus. That means I have a knowledge of God and I have a faith. But we call it a faith. No, it's not a faith. It's the faith. Amen. Faith is, is, is like having a jar of jam. It's no good just having a jar of jam. You have to spread it. 
We have to spread our faith. We have to put it into action. See, that's what it is to have faith in God. It means no matter what I'm going to go through, no matter what's going to happen in my life, to me, my wife, my husband, my children, my finances, I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus Christ. That's what true faith is. Jesus was saying, not my will be done, Lord. Because Jesus already said as a man, if there's any other way, but not my will be done, your will be done. We so are opposite to that. We want our will to be done. We, our prayers are so selfish. Our prayers are give me this and give me that and I want this and I want that. And then sometimes we tag on the end, if it's your will, Lord. We just tag it on the end like abracadabra. Or by saying in the name of Jesus, like it's going to be some magic prayer because we say in the name of Jesus. To say in the name of Jesus doesn't mean it's going to be a magic prayer. It means all of these things is in Jesus. It means these things I'm talking about. If I, if I was a Muslim and I said stop in the name of the law, it doesn't mean I'm the law, but I'm part of all that law. I have the, I have the authority of the law to arrest somebody. And the same way when we say Jesus Christ, it means that we have all the authority of God because we're in God and because we're living for God, we can speak for God in that area. We know the will of God. I've got to get on. Jesus says in the other gospel, he said, I have, Lord, take this cup from me. This cup. Now, cup is used a lot in the Old Testament, a lot in the Bible, um, as, as an ordeal. It's like something you're going to go through. You know, this man's, you know, he's, he's got a hard task ahead of him. He's got a difficult cup to drink. It's a picture that's used in the Old Testament. Now, the Bible says, when Jesus spoke about the cross, he said, I've got a baptism to take. Now, the cross isn't a baptism, but what it meant is I've got something greatly, deeply to go through on the cross. But when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he talked about taking the cup. Now the cup that's mentioned here is in Revelation 14, and I'll read it from verse 9. And the third angel followed them and spoke with a loud voice. Anyone worships the beast on his image and receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will drink the wine of God's wrath, which is mixed full strength in the cup of his anger. You see, the Jesus... The cup that Jesus had was to take the wrath of God that was going to come upon him because he was going to take the sin of the world and he was going to pay for the sin. So God's wrath, the Bible says, is on sinners. And in the, in, the, in, the, in the future times, in the book of Revelation, after the church is gone, when the tribulation is upon the earth, the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon the earth, upon the unbeliever. When Jesus died and Jesus took that cup, and this is the cup that he's talking about, this, in this passion, this cup, if there's any other way, take this cup from me, that he would take the cup of God's wrath and he would be separated from that, that he would know the penalty of sin upon himself. The penalty of sin is death and separation from God. And Jesus Christ took that cup for me and you in that garden that night. That was the start, that he takes that cup me and you should drink the cup of wrath. Me and you should pay the price for our sin eternally. The wrath of God, the Bible says, is upon all sinners. But let me just tell you something about Jesus Christ. If you belong to Jesus Christ and you're born again of the Spirit of God, you know what's happened? You were there. You were guilty. You were in sin. The wrath of God was going to fall on you the moment that you died. The wrath of God was already upon you, the Bible says. And Jesus comes. And we accept Jesus Christ as our personal self. We will repent of our sin. And Jesus takes that cup of wrath and he takes it himself and he pays the price on the cross 2,000 years ago. Because we are part today of the church of Jesus Christ, the church that Jesus Christ will take home, those who are born again in the Spirit of God, you won't receive the wrath of God. That's why we'll be raptured before the wrath comes upon the earth. And I'll tell you why. This is so important. If me and you are to go through the wrath of God, Jesus failed on the cross. He didn't do what he said he was going to do. He lied. He didn't take that cup of wrath. He didn't pay the penalty of sin. But he did. Thank you, Jesus. That he paid the price for our sin. That he took that cup of wrath that would be poured out upon all of this world. Let me just tell you something. That cup of wrath is going to be poured out on unbelievers or on you and on me. 
if only those who are in Jesus Christ, those who are born again of the Spirit of God, Jesus Christ has paid for the wrath, paid the penalty of your sin. We will drink it, or Jesus will. We will be separated, or he will bear your sin. Jesus says this, the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Nobody knows who he was talking about. I think maybe he was talking about himself almost there. Mm. We know, we, we say it about ourselves, you know, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, if you go to, if you're on a diet and you go into a place where there's all coffee and cream cakes, you say, oh, I just had it, I was weak. I give in to the flesh. I was willing, I, had, I was all, I was on the, Monday morning I was on the best diet in the world. But the flesh became strong and I fell. Yes. That's a perfect picture of what happens. Yes. We can talk a good Christianity. On Sunday morning we can be the best in the world. But my Monday morning, the flesh is strong. You have to remember, me and you as Christians now, are in a spiritual battle. Amen. We're in a spiritual battle. Mm. The devil wants to steal, kill and destroy. Mm. He, listen, he hasn't changed. He's got the same job as he did... 7,000 years ago. He wants to steal, kill and destroy and he hasn't changed. And just because you're, you're a Christian, that doesn't mean that he thinks, oh, that's it, they're, they're untouchable. No, he hates you because you're made in the image of God. He hates you because you're a child of God and he wants to destroy your life. And that's why we need to keep ourselves right with God. We must struggle against the flesh because if not, if we feed the flesh, it becomes strong. And no matter how willing you are, no matter how much spiritual you are on a Sunday, if you're feeding the flesh, that means if you're doing the things that's just of the, of the world, you'll be strong in the world, but you'll be weak in God. Mm. We have to, Jesus here, he actually wrestled in prayer. His heart was broken to the point of death as he prayed. What's our prayer life like? What's our prayer life against sin? When there's temptation coming, what's our prayer life like? When there's sin coming in our life and you see it coming, what's your prayer life like? Are we saying, you know, God, just take this away from me. I'm not going to, I'm not going to allow it, God. Please wrestle with me. Or do we just say, you know what? God knows my heart. You know what? I tried. You know what? It was difficult. You know what? I couldn't help myself. There has to be a start to change seed thought of change in our hearts and minds as Christians that we have to say you know what no matter what I'm following Jesus Christ no matter if there's pressure on no matter I'm going to tell you what happened right when you read Mark's gospel it says he prayed in the book of Hebrews the Bible says that Jesus offered up prayers and God helped him and the Bible says that an angel came to help Jesus as he prayed to strengthen him thank you Lord. let me just tell you so when you pray God strengthens you Amen. if you could only know today that prayer you go strengthened by God. See, let me just tell you something. Just stop praying prayers and pray. Stop praying prayers and pray. Just talk to God. You don't need to tell me. I don't need to tell you. But talk to God. You'll find strength in God. Strength in God is always in prayer. There's no big strong Christians. There's no great mighty men and mighty women. There's men and women that's on their knees knowing that God is their only strength. Are we willing to keep to pray to keep from temptation? Or are we just sleeping? Are we just waiting for the rapture? Are we just going to sleep and think I'm okay? I'm okay. Satan, when he entered into Judas, Judas went out and he took the thirty pieces of silver and he he knew he was guilty and he took it and he threw it back and it was blood money. And the uh, the Pharisees and there's the people in the temple, they knew they couldn't even keep the blood money. So they, they set it aside. They didn't know what to do with it because they knew it was tainted, dirty money. And so they bought a field for it called Akaldama, field of blood. And that was always used when anybody, any foreigners went to worship God in Jerusalem and they died there. It was a commoner's graveyard. That's, what, that's exactly what it was used for. It's in the Akaldama. It's, it's, in, the, it's in the place of hell, actually picture that's used of hell in the bible the valley of hinnon through the through the rubbish gate the dung gate is where the children were burned by molech to molech the god that's that same place 
And Judas went out and he hanged himself on a tree. See, Jesus died on a tree. Sin came by taking the fruit from the tree. And if sin isn't paid for, we will be cursed on a tree. We either take the death of Judas or we take the death of Jesus Christ into our lives. We will pay the price of the sin like he did or Jesus will pay the price of our sin. It's already begun, Jesus said. He says this, the son of my... Uh, then he came to his disciples and said to him, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the time is near. The son of my mind is being betrayed. That means it's already started. It's already started. It's being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Let's go. See, my betrayer is near. Let me just tell you something about the betrayer. He's always near. Amen. He's always near. Always near. Let me just tell you something. I don't want to put fear and fright into any Christian's life. If you're living for Jesus Christ, if you're saying no to sin and you're living a godly life and you're a man of a woman of God of prayer, you're a man or woman of that saying no to sin, you don't involve yourself in gossip or backbiting or thieving or drugs or drinking or all them things. If you're a man or woman that has loved God, then you're on good solid ground. Amen. Jesus is a rock of your salvation and you'll be okay. But if you start to feed the flesh... You start to do the things of the world. You start to think like people of the world. You want to attract the people of the world. Then your flesh will be strong and you're in dangerous ground. You're in a dangerous place. Because the devil is always near. The betrayer is near. Thank God tonight. For Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank God that he went to that cross. That he, In this garden he, he sweated drops of blood. Like the Bible says literally. It's clots of blood. Fell from his forehead like sweat. He dripped blood from his forehead like sweat. It's, there's a, a name. Hema, Hema something where the capillaries in your, in your head break. And the blood vessels break at the same time. And sweat at so much intense pressure. It takes the most intense pressure in the world to do that. But Jesus Christ shed his blood for me and for you. It started in the garden. And let me just tell you something. One day, it'll end in the garden. We'll be back with God in the garden of Eden. Hallelujah. Let's pray and thank the Lord for tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just want to thank you for the garden of Gethsemane, my God. I want to thank you what you have done for the likes of me, my God. I, I can never understand it, my God. I know I'm never worthy and never could be, my God. I just want to give you praise and glory tonight, my God. I thank you, Lord God. Lord, for your loving kindness and your grace and your mercy. And Lord, if there's any under the sound of my voice tonight that doesn't know you, my God, that know tonight they're separate and they're under the wrath of God tonight, my God, that they would turn to you and be saved tonight, my God. Lord God, for you so loved the world that you gave your one and only Son, that whoever may believe in us will not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, touch hearts and lives tonight, my God, I pray, Father. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, your son. <coughs> Amen. God bless you all. We have to stay and have a time of fellowship. There's a cup of tea and coffee is at the back. If there's any questions, please see me or one of the brothers at the front of you. And also, you know, if you're not a Christian tonight, or you know you're not far, you're not you're not right with God, come tonight. Take your stand with Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you all. <coughs>